Concerning your uh, sign up sheet, um, <coughs> curiosity why you have to sign up to ask questions instead of being able to ask a question like you normally would in most public meetings, where if you guys are discussing something, you raise your hand and you'd like to know or make a comment on that. Is there a particular reason you all do that this way? Um, I've never been in any meeting that had a sign up sheet to have it completed prior to a meeting starting. And I just want to know what your thoughts were on that and why you did that. Uh, well, I don't know if I can answer that. Well, uh, Mr. Graham, I will tell you that my interpretation of the Sunshine Law is that the board has to post a tentative agenda 24 hours prior to any meeting, and any items that will be discussed are supposed to be on that tentative agenda unless the tentative agenda is amended at the meeting, and that should be done sparingly. So the... Uh, the reason why people just can't throw up their hand and ask a question is we're supposed to stick to these topics on the sunshine. I, I was just curious about that because uh, to be on the council, I had to go to the Sunshine Law School, a class, and that was not something that we discussed or was told about, and that's why I'm asking that question. Um, I do know that under the Sunshine Law, you have certain things you have to follow, but there are some things that are interpreted in a different manner, and that's why I asked the question, because I don't see the sunshine law that way. But you, your, your agenda is your agenda, and you're supposed to have an open session where people can ask questions either before or after. I, I would disagree with you. I don't believe that's correct, but we'll have to agree to disagree. Okay. Thanks, sir. I'll turn it over to Mr. Williams. Okay, the first item that we have for this evening's work session items agenda is that of communication update. And in your package, you have the monthly report uh, communication log that was provided by Ms. Thompson. You can see that uh, Ms. Thompson has, has started <coughs> classes at CMO to pursue a degree in communications. <coughs> and she got a first class, she got an A. So, good job. <laughs> Uh, in addition to that, you can see the other items that she has been working on. We've been working on as far as uh, for next year, we've been looking at web hosting and uh, developing and looking at a new provider for our web page. And we've been interviewing uh, particular com companies uh, dealing with the web page. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Ms. Thompson has also signed up for the MOSPRA, the Massive Spring Conference, which is the MOSPRA is the PR group in the state of Missouri, which she is a member of, and she'll be attending that meeting along with myself and possibly some other members of the administrative office. In addition to that, you can see that she's been constantly updating Facebook and Twitter, and in addition, she is working currently on a video for the counselors for Council Appreciation Week. You see down there as well that we've had, for Twitter, we've had 126 new followers as of January, and we've had uh, 118 new followers 
in um, covering that of Facebook. Long time ago, I say a long time ago, back in October is when we brought up the discussion as far as the communication director. My proposal was at that time to go ahead and see how we do with this arrangement we have with Ms. Thompson. Right now, I feel very comfortable with the information that's being presented. I think that we're opening doors that we didn't have open before. I think the, the Twitter challenge that we had going there for some time, I think the, the openness of the Facebook, the revamping of our web page that we're starting to look at for next year, uh, along with the district newsletter and other items, brochure that we're looking at. Um, it, it's going to be my recommendation, although we can have discussion next month, but it's going to be my recommendation at that time to continue on with this uh, with Ms. Thompson. So, are there any questions with the communication update? We'll move on to our next item, which is the curriculum update and board policy IF. There was a subcommittee that was developed uh, for board members. We had Heather and Rebecca and Amy. Uh, Scott originally was on that committee, and then Scott and Grishley had to back out just because of job duties. So we met and discussed, uh, came up with some ideas, <coughs> some recommendations there, I believe, and then also uh, Mr. Mays and I and Ms. Hollifield met with the academic leaders and academic coaches and they also gave their their take on what they felt like as far as board policy IC. And in that policy IC it basically states, or does state, the board will review and approve each curriculum guide developed by the district. And I think that's what was basically discussed and that's kind of where we are. In addition to that of what was interpreted as far as what should be in the particular uh, curriculum guide. Um, my recommendation will be to the board is that we continue with board policy IF as is. And I tell you, why don't, Miss Carball, are you here? Yes. Did I see you? I saw you come in. Would you mind telling us, if you don't mind, or anybody else can chime in too, about the process that you go through in order to develop a curriculum? Say the kindergarten. Sure. At any uh, subject, I don't care. Okay. Uh, for instance, I have a, uh, three teachers, including the reading coach and myself, that sit with that, and we talk about what needs to be done. What I'm sorry. What needs to be um, addressed for the students? What uh, skills they need? What I mean to make them successful to be ready for first grade. So we sit down and we write it up. They tell Ms. Saucher is really good about putting it into the computer in the BYOC program. So they take care of putting that in there. Um, so the teachers really develop the curriculum themselves. They look, they do look at standards, like whatever the state has standards, to see what we need to do in that area too, to make sure are we hitting those things. Now there might be other things that we feel we need to hit as well besides that, and we will. Um, because we feel that our students would be successful in that area and need, need that for first grade. We collaborate with first grade teachers also to make sure that we do not have gaps between those two areas. But they write the curriculum and then I just oversee it to make sure that it hits everything that we need to do for successful learners. So it is teacher driven? Yes, absolutely. What comments do the board members have? Committee members, listen. Well, I, I just, uh, my takeaway from our meeting was that we were all in agreement that we thought it would be good to kind of define so that people knew what we were expecting and would like to see in terms of what this guide is, because everybody's saying, well, what's a guide? What, what is that anyway? And so we had talked about and came, come to an agreement, and I think Chuck was going to the right verbiage that I asked for. I didn't get a response back from you on that, Tom, because I didn't know that we weren't going to go forward with that until I really got this agenda. So, you know, there must have been conversation that was had after our meeting, because I thought we were all on the same page about how kind of defining that. I did notice, Chuck, that your, the curriculum that you gave us does do what we talked about at the meeting. You know, it gives resources so we see what the resources are and breaks it down in kind of like when are you going to get to this subject and when are you, how are you going to spend on this, which is really <coughs> all I was wanting to see. Anyway. I, I looked at a different report and had it all there. I thought that's probably more like what you're wanting, so that's mm -hmm. what you did. Yeah. So, I mean, if that's what we all think is the guide, then I think we're all on the same page and the guide is still the guide. 
And that's what I, that's what because I remember you saying in our meeting that you didn't have issue with the policy. It was just there are differences in what each board member needs to see to approve the curriculum, which I understand has always been an open policy to come and see whatever we would want to see as far as the curriculum. Um, so I did tell Tom after I thought about the meeting. Uh, and we left in your comment about the policy being okay, that I was okay with policy staying the way it was as well. So. Well, next time I think if we're going to have a subcommittee and get together and spend our time, that, we, that should be communicated to the whole subcommittee before it's landed back in our lap. Because, you know, I would have appreciated that. I think what um, is what is presented, well, is what you were talking about, right? With I, I agree. I just, rationale, yeah, and but, I had sequence to, and, but I had to go to the curriculum to see that Chuck, in fact, had, that's, we're all reading it the same way, but I didn't know that when I pulled up the agenda and it didn't have, and I didn't get any response back from anybody I apologize about that. why, you know, where is this change in policy, and I was waiting for that because that was what we agreed to do. So we're all on the same page as what I'm hearing anyway. Is there any, Mr. Mays, do you have any comments? I don't think so. I a question for you. So if you keep the policy the way it is, <coughs> from now on when we approve curriculum, is this what we're going to get? What, what he has sent out of what we got in, in our packet this month? I like that report. Um, I think it shows more information, so that's my intent. The only exception would be, and I think on one of the new courses, I believe it's the AP statistics. I didn't have the topics and units in there yet. We will have them in eventually, so I think it just has learning targets in the course description course rationale. Right but for the most part, yes. Well, I uh, think that be my if, if it's going to be for the most part, or that's my intent, I think that if, if it's not going to be set in stone, this is what we're going to get. If there's still going to be a well, this is what the policy says, a curriculum guide, what is a curriculum guide, what, then I think that we need to define it more than what it is now if, if, if this is not what we're going to get. If there's going to be an exception or if we're going to have this discussion every time there is curriculum that's up for approval, then I think that we need to change the verbiage in the existing policy that we have just so that we don't have to go through this every time because someone is upset or wants to see more or whatever, maybe we're changing it now if, if we can't agree that from here on out this is this is the kind of stuff that we're going to get. The only time there would be an exception is possibly a brand new course, new course right. that's working on the curriculum. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with this because I think at this point we're all agreeing on this is the same thing. And so if it does come up again, we'll just have to talk about it again. Well, I want to commend uh, the admin administration, the educators out there that put a lot of time in and work in, in putting this, this together. So it does take a lot of time. And I appreciate it. Is there any other comments on curriculum? I think it'll look good to have that on our, you know, like we're going to get the build on the curriculum and have out people looking at our school system be able to see that too. I think it's a very positive thing to put out there. Very good. Any other comments? Okay, moving forward, the next item is that of the insurance broker update. And as I mentioned in my write-up, uh, that information, the insurance broker bids were put out in the standard this past Sunday. And they will be due back to this office on February 17th. Uh, I did note there as well that if we do have two or more bids, we will need to have a committee of three board members uh, like we did last time in order to interview those individuals. We had three board members in addition to Ms. Borman, uh, myself, and it would be Ms. Hollowfield. Um, my recommendation to that before we move forward is I would like to recommend that Jim, Rebecca, and Matt be part of that committee. I'm fine with doing that. I, I do have some questions. Okay. And we need also the 
because of the early date of the work session that week of February 22nd is when we need to do interviews if they're going to be necessary. Uh, depending on the number of RFPs that are turned back in by companies, we just have two or three. We can do them in one evening because we set you know, a fairly short time period for those. But we could be looking at two evenings that week if we have more than three returned. Um, so the committee would need to be available like that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Wednesday just in case. We would, Shannon and I would be able to confirm on the 18th how many we have and the time slots. We'd be able to go ahead and confirm with the brokers when they could come in. So you can keep your schedule open those first three days till we get it back in. Fine. That was fine. Could we could we have Lori go ahead and present the information first? And if you have questions, well, would that be fine? I'd rather talk first if I can. Okay. Because I've, I've seen the RFP. I spoke to Lori a little bit. I have requested this be put on for our work session in anticipation that we could discuss what we want to bid, and because we had a discussion in the fall about. It breaking up our insurance bidding and that that's not, I think, the best way to go about doing it. We need to have a real competitive bid process. And this is a very short, quick schedule to get anybody to participate in it. And I think that our school is, would benefit from having a different process going on right now. Um, and I would have talk about this without you having put all that work into it, Lori, because I know you did put a lot of work into that RFP, but I've talked to a lot of people in the insurance industry about this process, and they are telling me that the way to do this is to go ahead. The way you find out who's going to give you your best numbers and what the pricing is going to be, and is you let them go out and negotiate and come up with who they can come to the table with. Because in order to be competitive and to show you what they've got, you don't go, I want some homeowner's insurance, and they say, well, I'm going to tell you why I'm the best broker, and I'm going to tell you why I'm the best broker. They, I want to see the numbers. I want to see what it's going to cost. I want to see what ancillary benefits they can give my employees. I want to see you know, the insurance bid itself, the big health insurance bid, is going to be the same to any broker. It's going to be the same thing. And so what you need to know is, who can I bring to the table with me as a broker and tell you why you need me? So I think we need to bid the health insurance. We need them to give us a package. What are your ancillary benefits? What's your health insurance going to be? Which is going to be <coughs> the same. What do do? you have a program that does open enrollment online? What can, do you have a program that if you're allowed to give these ancillary benefits an opportunity to be taken up by your employees, you're going to do the, the uh, ACA and the open enrollment for free. And you're going to be our TPA. There's, that's the way I believe from my in investigating and researching this that we need to do it. So my concern is that I, I truly think we need to amend our RFP and extend our deadlines out because nobody in the industry can go out and negotiate these deals in under 60 to 75 days. But if you come back in April, middle April, then you've got everybody able to have their health insurance to show you, the ancillary benefits, whether it's going to be open enrollment online, ACA reporting. You do it all at once. That is my opinion. I'm real concerned about doing this way because I don't think people are going to come in and bid. They know they're not going to get it. I talk to the brokers in the community, and they're not going to get it. They're not going to be able to do this. And so I, I don't like the whole thing. Well, the flip side of that, though, is, is that insurance brokers go get bids from various carriers. So the carrier, let's say Anthem, for example, let's say Anthem bids on a package. They, they've got to bid it through a broker. So if, for example, we revise it and we want them to bring health insurance bids with them, then the broker's going to have to, the, the Anthem's going to have to bid that through whichever broker they pick. So the idea is that you have a broker to 
get those same, I mean, Anthem's bid's going to be the same as it is from if I were an insurance agent or if, or if Tom was an insurance agent. I mean, that's going to be Anthem's bid. So the problem with that, and we've been through the same, the same issue where we were then insurance packages, you know, with brokers from various states. The problem is, is that the broker or the, the insurance company ends up having to pick whatever horse they're going to ride in. So you, you, can, you can do it that way, but you're not necessarily getting any different competitive bids than if you're picking an insurance broker. The idea of why when we did this this way, why we interviewed brokers <clears throat> is so that we could pick who we thought had the best expertise and the relationships out with insurance carriers to get those competitive bids. But bids are going to be the same unless, you know, unless you... Well, and that's, that's what we ran into, and that's why we went to the broker, because I don't know if you remember the last time we bid out the insurance, Scott, but it was literally every company that came in had United Healthcare for this price, United Healthcare for this price. Right. So it didn't make any sense, because you're still picking, you're basically picking your broker because the cost is the same. So that's why we went to but the broker. But I thought well, some couldn't that. bid it, though, if, they, if, if uh, say, self-insurance got a bid from Anthem. The Mitchell may not be able to bid to Anthem. Is another first come, first serve? That's incorrect. That is incorrect? I, I talked to, uh, we have an insurance division. We just hired a guy, and I'll say Gallagher. I, evidently, that's a big benefits uh, company in the insurance industry. He came to work for our, let me back up, our bank owns an insurance company. And he I, has nothing to do with me, but other than it's a, the division of our company. So I called this guy. This guy's, a, this guy's a, an expert in the benefits administration field. So I called him. You know, I'll have to uh, give him my ignorance on this subject because I'm not as well versed as some may be. But I told him the process in general. He said that's that's how all municipalities and everybody knows it. They essentially interview a broker because he said, I'll go to the exact same companies that any other broker will. We'll get the exact same bid. The only difference would be uh, could possibly the commission structure. Yeah, but I mean, there are, it's not just health insurance you're looking at, because you are it's, generally going to get it's, that it's same benefits. bid. Yeah. But if you're not yeah. looking at benefits, you're looking yeah. at what, you know, what level of services you're going to get with, you know, like I said, open enrollment or ACA. Um, you know, just like we were, we had you know, the cut rate on the, the potential for life insurance in the fall. I mean, it's, a, it's about how you package it and what relationships they have. And if nobody can be, I mean, it, to allow it to be competitive, I have been told that you have to be able to go out and do your deals with the, the providers of the insurance with the ancillary benefits and stuff. And you're going to get the same thing on your health insurance, though, on, for anybody going out on it. So, but isn't I, that the... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Isn't that, and maybe Beth can refresh my memory, but isn't that what we, after we hired Mitchell as the broker, then we bring us the bids for the health insurance? And at that point in time, that's when we can, that's when we can say we want these ancillary services for free or what kind of packages. Because I was thinking that's what we were talking about with the monitoring and the online is when we actually go out for a bid. Am I right? Is it okay for me yeah. to speak? Um, <laughs> Yeah, the way you would, the way we do it is, we hired us as a broker three years ago, January of 13. We went out to the market. We got a quote from Anthem, United Healthcare, Coventry, HealthScope. We ended up with HealthScope. At that time, now, I have many times said you need to be quoting ancillary benefits. That's not something that the district was ever in a position to do. So that wasn't part of the RFP in 13. But what you would do is the same thing. You, if you, if at that point you would have said, we want health insurance, ancillary benefits, we want a benefit admin system, what I would do, what any broker would do, is go to the market and they would say, I'm gonna get y'all all the bids for the ancillary benefits, all the health benefits, all, you know, the four or five different benefit admin companies, and we're going to bring it all together and show you, we're going to see what is the most competitive. And that's, 
That's what. That's what this guy's going to do. Is Gallagher, are they a big deal? Gallagher is a giant agency yeah. in St. Louis. Yeah. Yes. So and we that's hired, what they We hired do. him to our to our insurance company. He said that's that's the way it's, that's what happens. Gallagher is actually our property and liability. Okay. They're a um, music. Oh, okay. They, they handle music. Okay. They, the and so he, he said this is how I, I'm just going by his. He has no, you know, right. no. He just said that's how it happens. That's how municipalities and school districts and all those things, that's how they do it. Well, and, and just to back up a little too, um, the RFP is thorough in giving any broker the opportunity to come in and say, this is what we can do for you. That's what we need to know at this point in my opinion. Uh, we did it three years ago when we unfortunately got out of music and couldn't get back in for five years with property and liability and the room was full of various brokers and they all brought the exact same bids in from the exact same companies and the way it was decided in this room was names were put in a hat and drawn out. There was no other way to decide. That's not a good way of doing business. So you're exactly right. We're going to see lots of the same things. And as I explained to you on the phone, our big hurdle right now is, yes, it would be great to have a life insurance benefit. It would be great to have a platform with bells and whistles. We we know we need help with 1095Cs, you know, and anything else that's coming down with ACA compliance. But all of that is in the bid. What can, what can you tell us? How are you going to help us? Because I'm going to tell you, our standard operating procedure right now is we have one assistant in HR who handles fields questions about the policy and make sure that the bills get paid. And then we pick up, if it goes past one simple question and collecting the money for that month's premium, then we pick up the phone and call the broker who then in turn deals with the TPA or Health Link or wherever the problem is because we don't have the staff in house to deal with that. So those are the types of services that we need our handheld. That's what we're looking for in a broker. Are you going to come in and are you going to give us the service that we can just pretty much turn it off to you, know, to you when there is a problem? But the big hurdle we have is that you're looking at your health plan and at an 80% benefit, it's $1.6 to $1.7 million. And we don't know what our renewal is going to be. Right now, we're deferring 5% of that premium to the health insurance account. And if we keep having weekly bills that are astronomical and we get much below $800,000, we are going to get to a point, we got there last night where we had to write a, uh, on the operating side, we had to write a $200,000 check to the insurance account to cover that offset because the claims just exceeded what we had in the bank to pay the bills with and then we got reinsurance checks and y'all know that whole story. But my point is at some point you, you can have enough small claims that aren't going to trigger reinsurance to do that. So we're charging about $160,000, $170,000 to that insurance account annually to cover that 5%. So our hurdle here is to get a broker that's going to take care of us, number one. Two, to get someone in that First, they're only focus, and it says that in the RFP, is the first thing we need you to focus on is to get us a good health plan in here that will be affordable with coverage that us as employees are used to and hopefully be able to get maybe that 5% back into the budget this year. And then, excuse me, and then we can shop ancillary products and platforms and all of that through the insurance committee in the fall. That's why the timing in the fall to bring that was good. It's never good to bring it when you're already looking at this big plan. So that that's the purpose of how it's laid out. I'm concerned about, I mean, it, it, is, do we have to do it? You're saying this quickly. We can't broaden the time. Well, the way the RFP is set, for what the brokers to bring in for this RFP is just come in and toot your own horn. What can you do for us? They're not having to bring in numbers at this point. We, I, In my opinion, and it's just my opinion, we don't want to muddy the water with numbers at this point. Because what I'm worried about at this point is what can you do for us? Because anybody that is that is going to work in this area is going to bring in an Anthem, and they're going to bring in a Coventry and United Health Group, and we're going to see the same numbers. We're going to ask them in the interview process, do you partner with any companies that have platforms that will help us get our benefit notifications out to people? Um, you know, do you... Do you work with a group that has nurses that will work with our staff who currently have that? Uh, those are types of things that the questions will be geared toward. 
So for them to come in and tell us what they can do, if we, if we lengthen the time frame any on just picking a broker, you're going to be doing a disservice to anybody new that would come in because you're just giving them from early March to early May to bring the numbers. Well, and it wouldn't be true that anybody who would want to participate in that needs to see a picture of like the claims history and the census. And, and the that. census is available to them. That's going to that take no, a No, we have the census already. Look at you have the look through your claims history so that somebody can come in. We, we have the census at this point, and it doesn't take us any time to get the information that they need. I just, I really got a different view, which is what I shared to begin with, from what you guys are saying from the four people that I spoke to. This you know, was not going to allow them to be competitive. Lori, how long has Mitchell Insurance had the uh, school insurance? For, we had them, I know we had Anthem for 26 years. Um, and so they were, they were the agent of record at that time. It was a different terminology. They were agent of record through those years, officially as broker, when we officially hired a broker, it was three years ago. But they've been agent of record since probably 28, 30 years. So that's the whole point, okay? You have one insurance company in Sykeston that's had the school insurance for 30 years. What it really amounts to is that you can say we're going to interview brokers you're going to have the same broker as you've had for 30 years. You're not, it's not a fair process because you're not going, no one in here is going to vote against Mitchell Insurance because the president of the school board is Mitchell Insurance. That's really the real, the whole picture. When you talk to insurance agents in this town, because I have this week, I've contacted them, they won't even bid it. They won't even come in here and try to get this because they know that there's no way they'll get it. Because, like you said, they've had it for 30 years. Is that right? No, it's not right. I take offense to that. It's always the best bid. No. It, no, wait, let me say this really quickly. Um, last year we had two people, so self-insurance and partnership with another. Wall Street. I know, I was not on the committee. Uh, and Mitchell Insurance. Um, it's our job as board members to always vote for the best uh, option for the district. So I take offense that you said we would not vote for what's best for the district. And I don't believe that that's true. I think that since I've been on the board, and it's you know going on many, many years now, um, I have never seen us not take the best option for our district. Because this is a huge item and it, it takes a lot of time. It takes us, you know, a lot of uh, uh, explanation goes into us picking this. It's huge. The recommendation comes from the insurance committee and it has. The only thing that has changed is now that we do this broker, it's a little bit different. But the insurance committee is the one that had for 26 years came to the board and said this is our recommendation and that's a committee made up of retired and active teachers so I take offense to that I'm, I'm telling you what when, when I called the insurance companies in this town and said that the insurance is up for bid I want to let you know because I know a lot of them personally that is what they said to me I, that that is what they said account. to me and if you look at the history okay of Having the same insurance broker or agent of record, whatever the terminology is, they've had it for 30 years. And so people in this community who own insurance agencies, that's their feeling. So I think when Rebecca says that the process is not, may not be right, I mean, I think that there is some merit to that because if you have people in this community who feel like that it's a done deal, which if you look at the history, that's what history shows, maybe you need to change your, your process. Maybe we need to do something differently so that you give the community a different feeling that we're trying to make it fair. And 
maybe that's what we need to look into. Hang on, let me make a comment. We're, I don't know. How long has the bank, how long has the school bank been going to make? Same thing. 20, how long have you been to You can call any banker in town, and we, when have we been? It was before I was on the board, two it, years it's ago? Been three, three years ago? Three years ago? We Maybe bid two. It. I'm not sure. We bid it every five. Okay, okay. It was, it was up, and we bid it. Um, essentially, all the bids were the same. And, and it comes down to what are we going to pay, what are the banks going to pay for the deposits? If everybody is at, and I'm just using numbers, at 1% on the deposits, and I wish you probably wish we okay. could get 1%. <laughs> if everybody was at 1%, how many accounts does, how many accounts does the school have? We have six. Six accounts. What kind of process would that be to move all that? It would be a lot a, of work, but it's few, doable. It is. Yeah, but it's doable. But, it wouldn't make sense to move for an eighth of a point. Right. It has to be a noticeable change. You don't just change necessarily to change. And so I knew going in, we probably weren't going to get it. Because there's no reason for the school to change unless I was going to offer something ridiculous, which I wasn't going to. You still have to make money on those deposits. But again, and this is along the same lines, I wish I had the school's deposits. I don't. But I know we're probably not going to get it because all banks are similar and similar to the bids that we're going to get with health insurance. And it's it's essentially the same way. But don't you think that's what Rebecca's point is, is that what she's saying is if you just interview a broker and you come in and you say, this is what I can do with you, this is what I can do with you. Well, Mitchell has 30 years um, track record with the school, right? Okay. So to make it fair, wouldn't you say, okay, let's bid this out and let's see what creative ideas you can come up with for the school. But they asked, that in the RFP for banks, they asked, what's something creative you could do for the bank? No, I'm talking oh. about what can you bring, what extra can you offer the school they asked and still that. keep the, maybe, maybe one can offer ACA reporting and, and all these life insurance. Dental that's, that's asked on the RFP and it's asked on the bank RFP. What can we do differently than Montgomery Bank? Essentially nothing. Now, but I think you we have, have better the figures, customers. Sir. If you don't have the figures, <laughs> yeah. you know, in front of you of what is the school paying now, what are all the benefits, and all these things. If you're not, if you don't have that in front of you, because to it's come all in, going to be the same. I mean, that's what. That's the point. There, but the ancillary products that you offer <clears throat> may not be, because you may have someone else that can do a little something different is all I'm trying to say. Did you not send out what we asked in yes. the interview process? Yeah, that's, yes, that's, that's in the, the RFP to tell yes. us yes. what right. can you bring that's, to the table. So that's, so that's what that I'm that saying. Option. That's essentially, that's essentially, and that's what you asked, and I'm, I'm just relating this to banking because it's what I know. She, in the RFP it says, what can you do different, or what can you do different, differentiate yourself from? So, so one thing that's, the one thing that's, that is, is why, why wouldn't they fit is, that, well, if you had a service issue, and if you had a poor service, then that would be a reason to switch. Yeah. That's going to come up in this process to determine if they're a credible broker. Obviously, for quite some time, past school boards and the teachers and people that are on the insurance committee have felt like that they provided good service. You know, it's a, it's a big account, and they're, and I'm, I'm not advocating them, right? We haven't even interviewed the brokers yet, but I think it's a disservice to an insurance agent to say well they're not going to bid because the fix is in i don't think that's i don't think that's true at all they have particular expertise at this account because they've handled it before that's a that's I, I a didn't say the fix was in i didn't say that okay. i'm just saying well, you, you said that they they, they feel like since there's a track record of 30 years that there's no way they're going to get the okay. business and from what we're putting out and the way the process is they feel like it's very unfair and there's no reason for them to even bid. And so I think that's what Rebecca is saying when she's saying that to make it a more fair process. That, and I'm not saying that Mitchell hasn't provided, I'm not saying anything about Mitchell Insurance. I want to be very clear. I think Mitchell Insurance is a very reputable, I mean, I, I like, they have very wonderful people that work there. I mean, I have no, this is not anything about Mitchell Insurance. Let me make that very clear. What, where I'm coming from is, I want to be very transparent with our community, and if we have insurance agencies in town, 
that feel like this is not a fair process and that they don't have a chance and that there's no way they're going to get this insurance, all I'm saying is maybe we need to look at something different. Maybe, maybe Mitchell will have the best, and that's fine. I'm, but I'm just saying, if this is the, is this what you've heard with what well, you called? That, that's, I'm, I'm saying this, start this out as the process because the, <clears throat> there's no time really that exists to be able to start that process now that this bid is out go out there and get come up with the things that they can come and say, here's what I can do for you because first they've got to look at all this information and take it out to the people they have relationships with. And that takes 60 days. They need in-depth information to come back with a health plan because these carriers uh, want to know certain data for their ancillaries to make projections. Just like we had this conversation in this room the last two years. The ancillaries for our current carrier health scope think our claims are going to be $4.6 million. We're banking on them being a little bit less than that, and we hope that comes through. But their ancillaries are saying, based on all of this, but we don't need that at this point for to pick a broker, in my opinion. Again, if, if it's ABC Insurance Company and they partner with whatever company out here and they bring these products in, we don't need them to reinvent the wheel. We just need them to come in and say, these are the services that we can provide. This is why we want to do business with you. Uh, th to me, that's what we're looking for at this point. And Prior to three years ago, I probably might have agreed with the statement that maybe they didn't feel like they had a chance at a change being made. But when we separated this out and made it its own entity, this RFP standalone entity, so that people could come in and say, here we are and we are fantastic and here's why you need us. To me, that's, that's as fair as the process can get. Um, you know, we take a lot of pride in the integrity of our bid process. We're going to do a lot of bids this, this spring. Uh, we're, we're bidding this. We've got our insurance bid. It'll be a copier bid year. It's a school picture bid. We follow the same process every year, and it's in the RFP. If you need information, you get it. <coughs> if we can't get that to them in a timely manner, then that's when you come back to the committee and say, we're, not, we're, going, to have to, we're going to have to push this back. Because here's what they say they need, and this is what we can't get them. Um, the other thing that we're very adamant about uh, is we identify one contact person in a bid process. In this particular process, it's, it's me as the individual. So that the questions come to one person, one person is giving that answer, and if company A asks a question and want clarification on the, you know, the second thing, and listed in the scope of work, then that answer, and Matt can attest to this, it goes to everybody in the bid process, whether they wanted clarification or not. So everybody gets the same information, the same verbiage, all of the questions come to one person, and that protects the integrity of the RFP. Because if not, then you have that liability out there that you didn't handle one broker the same way as you handled another. So, and, and, and I, in hindsight, when I talk with Mr. Williams, one thing that I think we needed to correct this round, which is in the RFP, is it's not a good thing to bid your broker in the same year you're building, bidding your health plan. Now, statute says you have to bid your health plan every three years. That, that's statute. There's not a statute on how often you have to bid your broker. And so in an effort to even make the process more fair, We've staggered that so it will take 20 years before it ever lines up again. And that way you have an opportunity to not have this big hurdle that you're looking at, this $1.7 million budget item that you know you've got to get a good renewal on because the people in this room that are employees don't want to see a 27% increase on their health insurance. So, so that's your focus. You don't want to get it. We've seen, we've seen it before. <laughs> so you, you, you don't want that. So we've staggered this so that it won't come again. And that will give a broker an opportunity in future years to, to
to have an opportunity to bring more things in. But once we get a broker in place, if they tell us now this is everything we can bring to the table, then we get over the hurdle of the health plan, then we have an opportunity to come back to the board in multiple months <coughs> to bring life insurance plans or partner with a company that has great software that will that they can go online and then not look at their benefits, those types of things. Um, so to me, I, I just don't see where the process is not fair. Um, and to, this is not as long a term by any means, but we had a, a, a working relationship with a food service company that when it was bid at the end of that five year term, they still had the best bid, but we changed because their service was not what we needed. So I think the district has a history of doing what is best for the district in a bid year. And you also have the opportunity, this, these are one year increments because we're not allowed to obligate to the boards. So when you're, if, if you make a change or if you stay with someone and you're not happy a year later, you can do the process. <clears throat> you, you know, that you just cannot obligate future boards to have a relationship with someone ongoing. Well, I hope when you all have these conversations that you all encourage them to put a bid in because I think the best thing for the board is to have multiple bids. Um, it, it makes it for a more competitive environment. And so I hope I hope your all's conversations were about inviting them to produce a bid because, and, and it wasn't like the comment of that no one would vote against Mitchell because I think we all should be encouraging all of these businesses to come and bid on our schools. Well, and that, that's why I presented as a factual this process, this is what I've come to, I wanted to encourage people because I want us to get the best, the best numbers we can. And that's the only reason I was talking about it. And I don't know who Heather talked to, I know who I talked to, so I, I don't know, but I certainly the was encouraging people to do that and they said there's no way we can do it. Look at the way this is set up. See, my, my thinking is, is that the, the reason you want it, that using a broker makes a lot more sense compared to what we used to do is if we were at Anthem for 26 years and Mitchell was the agent on that, <coughs> and you're going to do a renewal with Anthem, you're likely not going to switch agents because they're the agent of record that sold you that Anthem policy. Whereas interviewing different brokers, let's say we end up staying with Coventry slash HealthScope, right? You you could enter you could interview a broker and we could switch brokers and change the broker record and continue on with the same company that we're that we're with, but that doesn't really happen if you continue just to use the agent that was that was broker and uh, Anthem. And generally speaking, you're going to want to try to do a renewal. I mean, you don't want to switch healthcare carriers every year and every other year. I mean, right, and and they have done so. Stuff. So the broker the job gets with keeping our. our so there's, a, so, I mean, there's more of an opportunity for actually another insurance broker to step in into place, even if we stayed with the group. Whereas before, if it were Mitchell as the agent of Anthem, and you were in with Anthem, then you're not going to change agents, really. I don't think you could, and I think that's what Scott was talking about. Maybe that's what... Oh, you could change agent record. You I can do think, a ladder But I thought record. when we used to have Anthem, when we wanted to stay with Anthem, that we... Nobody enough, else would bring an Anthem bid to us. That Mitchell was the only one allowed to bring us. They probably did. They could, but they probably didn't. They'd have to have a letter I thought they from could. the school to say you need to open your bid. But the uh, bid's going to be... The, the Anthem bid's going to be the Anthem bid. It is. That's mm -hmm. right. So... No. So at that point, you're you're a, you're evaluating at that point the renewal with the with the agent that has it. I mean, you, you just a lot better off with a broker who's going to independently and uh, ask various carriers to permit to present competitive bids. But this point of changing brokers right now is the opportunity to step right into those shoes with the current with the. Uh, I'm just being told what I prepared. It's, well, it's, you know, not the way you're going to get them into the I know she did. Yeah, you Any other comments? All right, thank you, Lord. Move forward.
<coughs> Next item is that of the focus school update. I emailed you back on January 5th, 20th, excuse me, 15th, indicating that Matthews had been identified as a focus school. And within your packet, within your attached information, there is some information as far as what a focus school is, how they're identified, and so on and so forth. Before I go on with this, I just want to use it. State. I don't want to steal the thunder of Southeast. The Southeast has been doing, I've been part of the focus school for the last four, four years. And they finally have the test scores up past that point now, which is very good. They have to continue that for another two years. And once they've done that, then they're able to move forward with that. So I'll let Mr. Mays go ahead and share the information on the focus school. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Sorry. I do have an additional document that I uh, pulled off Desi's website. That shows that shows uh, some additional information about why Matthews was designated as a focus school. Hold on, down. You're welcome. Uh, and I'm going to sit while I do this because I have information in front of me. Um, as the board is aware, Matthews, as, as Mr. Williams just said to you, Matthews was classified as a focus school recently by Desi. Desi, uh, this designation, and this is on the sheet that you got that was uh, on Vdox. Uh, this designation comes because Matthews was in the lowest 10% of Title I schools for super subgroup students. I'll remind you, I know you know, but sometimes if you don't deal with it all the time, it doesn't hurt to remind you. Uh, students in the su super subgroup are students who are African American, Hispanic, qualify for free or reduced lunch, have an IEP, or are classified as English language learners. So any student within that group is considered a member of the super subgroup. I thought you might be interested to know. Uh, that 68.9% of the students in Matthews Elementary are included in that super subgroup. Okay. What number again? 68.9%. I know you've asked me that before, and I thought I've got this information. I'll just count it. Uh, the responsibilities that Matthews has, and I'm not going to read everything on the sheet, you can read it for yourself, but basically, Matthews will have to develop an accountability plan, <coughs> excuse me, like Southeast did to address their academic progress. Uh, Mrs. Hartzog has been offered the opportunity to attend Moly training, and that's on the leadership component on here, and she is willing to accept that offer. Um, and then Desi will support the work that Ms. Hartzog and her staff are going to do uh, with a focus grant in the amount of $26,073, excuse me again, which is similar to uh, the Southeast grant. Annual? Well, we don't know. Um, That's just the first time. Around. Yeah, we never know for sure. Southeast used to be Southeast got in the in the approximately twenty three thousand something for this upcoming year. In the past, it's been more than that, but it was cut this year, so we never know until we get the allocation. In fact, we're just getting the allocation this month, and you know it's been halfway through the school year before we get it, so we just have to wait until this is able to give us that information. Uh, the exit target is on the sheet that I gave you on the bottom right hand corner. The exit target for Matthews Elementary is 29.9%. So just to remind you, that's what Mr. Williams was referring to a moment ago. For Matthews to exit from the focus school status, they have to reach that 29.9% target and hold it for three years. That target is calculated, if I'm going too fast, stop me, um, by looking at the percentage of students who are proficient and advanced in third and fourth grade in a super subgroup, okay? And they take the percentage for reading and the percentage for math and do an average of those two percentages. So if Matthews can reach the 29.9% for three years and not be in the bottom 10% of performing Title I schools in the state, they'll exit the process. Do you have a question? Yeah, well, where does the 29, is that, is that just a number plucked out of the air? They, they, they pull it, and I'm going to show by ignorance here, they pull it from the base year you're supposed to show a 3% increase in your rate for the base year, which should be 2015. And if I look at that base year in 2015, I don't get 29.9. I mean, I get, in fact, it would have to be 3% higher than that. So I don't know at this point. I'm just being honest with you. And I'm hesitant to ask because my percentage would be higher than that. So just being honest. Yeah, is this, is this a rolling average, or does this mean that they're, no. it's a focus school for three well, years? Well, it is, it is a rolling average. They average the, the data for three years, right. okay? And you have to have that 29% average for those three years, <coughs> for three years. 
So I that's a focus weird. school for three years. Three They're a focus years. school for three years no matter what. Okay. And as Mr. Williams was saying about Southeast, they hit the exit target this year. Uh, Ms. Jordan's going to present the information Tuesday night. If they can maintain that for two years with that three-year average and, and not be in the bottom 10%, they'll exit the program. Okay? Um, I had a few more things to add. Oh, no, you're okay. I, I'm happy with the questions. I just don't want to miss something tonight, too. Uh, beginning in March, Mrs. Hartzog will be presenting monthly updates to the board just like Mrs. Jordan did. So she's very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I'm making a little bit light of her presenting to the board, but it is disappointing, uh, though not completely surprised that Matthews has been given this designation. Mrs. Hartzog and I, Mrs. Hartzog and I talked last year when we got the 2014 scores. If you look at those, you might want to glance at those little sheets. In 2014, <laughs> Matthews had 23.4% of the super subgroup efficient in ELA and 18.7% in math. And they, I mean, to be honest, just tanked that year. And that percentage where it's then, and as Matt was talking about, since it's a three-year average, that percentage is still haunting us, which is why this year we did end up dipping down below that that uh, that amount. And if you look at the 2015 scores, we actually showed a pretty decent improvement, especially in math in 2015. Doesn't matter, we've still got the three-year average. So I do think that the uh, the assistance that Ms. Hartzog will get with the Moly project, the uh, funds that are there to support, we've seen uh, Southeast benefit from that, and so I think that will be helpful. So, like I said, it's disappointing, but uh, we'll work with it, do the best we can. And I do think we have an excellent opportunity for both schools to exit this in a few years. Any questions? Is there going to be reapplications? A lot of stuff that Southeast has already done, can that be reapplied to Matthews as far as. And the, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't reinvent the wheel. Yeah. I, I talked to, and, and if you want to jump in, feel free to, because you know more than I know. I did recommend to Mrs. Hartzog to talk to Mrs. Jordan. And, and I, I'm afraid to say too much, I don't want to steal Ms. Jordan's thunder for, for uh, the upcoming meeting on Tuesday. But Mrs. Hartzog attended a meeting at Risco a week ago, last week. Last week. And in the meeting, uh, it was area schools, not just our school, it was any school that's newly, newly in the focus school prom program. In the meeting, the examples that were given repeatedly by Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. <laughs> Uh, were, were Southeast. He kept saying, Ms. Jordan does this, Southeast does that. So those were the example documents. So, so Ms. Hartzog's already hearing that, and it's kind of the same thing I told her. And she has talked to Ms. Jordan. I don't, do you want to say anything else about that? I know you guys have chatted about. We've talked, and then we're setting up a meeting to, where I can go over there, and we can really go into detail about what, all, what steps that need to be taken. I know that you're pleased with the reports that you get from Ms. Jordan. And I don't, unless you're looking at, at this information, the accountability plan that she writes is, is absolutely top notch. And the data that she keeps and, and what she does at the building has been really good. So I do think that, that the the praise that she was given uh, by Ken was worthy, and I think that uh, Matthews will benefit from that. Can we reapply some of that to Lee Hunter, even though they're not a focus school? That's a good question. You can actually, there are some things you can do. Now, we can't use the money to pay for right. uh, things at this time, but if they work together on projects, that's perfectly fine. There have been some uh, things, and with Southeast being a focus school, Alicia talks a lot about the curriculum work that she's done mm -hmm. with reading and math. That's all been shared with Matthews and Lee Hunter, and they're using that. Now, they may not do exactly the same thing as our, but they're using it as a base for some of the work they've been doing. And I think some of your teachers went to Med or went to Southeast mm -hmm. and met with them about some of the programs they've been doing. So yes, to answer your question, yes. When I worked for Parker and Gamble, it was search and reapply still shamelessly. Yes. I, mean, I, I agree. No, no, I agree. no point in reinventing the wheel. And we'll be proactive because I know yeah. some concerns like you know, if we don't on track and we don't. Yes. I looked because I thought you might ask that question too. Uh, Lee Hunter's three year percentage at this point for the super sunker is thirty four point seven percent. So it's not that close to to where Matthews and Southeast are. Now I also want to say thirty four point seven percent is nothing to be excited about. So when Amy or Matt, I think it was Amy said, are they going to work together? I think it would be wise to do so because Lee Hunter could also benefit from the group. So is the twenty nine point nine is that a is that a state standard? Or is it the standard based on our numbers? Based on our numbers. Oh, okay. Yeah, based on our numbers. And if you remember when, when Southeast first started this project, we had shown 25% improvement 
And that was, and I even said at the time we presented that, that's not doable. Uh, we're going to struggle with that. Uh, and the state has realized that and brought that down to 3%, which is very doable. Are, are there a set number of focus schools? Bottom 10%. Okay. Forming. So that's why yes. the number moves around. Yes. And I don't have the list in front of me, but I, I know, I think you can talk about the districts, but just so you know, uh, New Madrid has a focus school this year, first time. Matthews Elementary, New Madrid's a focus school. Um, Campbell South Sky Schools, Scott City uh, Elementary School, I believe, is. They've been one for a few years. Right. Uh, Brothersville, I believe, has been. Hey, Ty's added on. Um, they've added quite a few schools this year, it seems like. And, and you're right. One of the things Crystal shared with me, too, is that both of both the schools are located in, in around the St. Louis area, Kansas City, and Southeast Missouri. 121 focus schools throughout the state. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. I believe Williamsville Elementary, which is in Greenville, I think. They are. I think they're out of it. I think they're able to go with that three year average. And, okay. Somebody oh, wow. in Greenville was at the meeting. Maybe they were just there. Well, I know he used their information too as a sample, and they may have been there to help him with the system with the presentation. So the way it's said, it, Theoretically, you could be in three years, out three years, and then right back in. For you could be. Yeah. Okay. And it's possible. All right. It's possible. <clears throat> Not that I want that to happen. No. 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 Sure. no. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, which is on that of hiring. And as I mentioned in the notes, again, back in July, we had a lengthy discussion on that. And what I included in your, your attachment is kind of what we put together, one part of the discussion, which would relate more to GCD-1, which is the hiring procedures. Uh, what we added to that, based upon that discussion from July, was down there towards the end of number five under hiring process is that we will present, instead of one candidate, we'll present two candidates. We will not inform those candidates until they, after they've been formed, informed by, or excuse me, approved by the Board of Education. So in other words, if we have one, we have one that does not want to accept the position, we would go on to number two. Um, I do want to stress, I am somewhat concerned by this, I'm just gonna throw this out, we are going to have to meet, and that's one of the things we're going to have to meet so that some of these applicants don't get away, yeah. so to speak. So I think we're all aware of that. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. right. And, and I just want to stress that again because that, that is a concern of mine. And you may not have to. Maybe not. Maybe not. That's a very good point. Yeah, I mean, if there aren't two good ones that you feel good about, you, know, you can't present to But I still think this falls yeah. into the not telling the candidate before we hire them. So right. even if we only have the one, like you say, you we're still going to have to meet. Right. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah well, this is going to be the problem. But at a certain time. Particularly in the yeah. summer. Right. 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 Yeah. right. Exactly. Because that's when we have usually uh, June, July, sometimes in August, we, we do have a, a ton of teachers that we have to go ahead and try and hire. Are there any questions on that procedure? I wanted you to see the hiring procedure, how that is done, how we go about that, the screening process. You'll notice in there, as far as how the job is listed, it also lists the screening tool. And that's a very, very extensive type of tool that we have to go through. What we do is we'll have a set or a team of three to four people, usually those people, employees are within the, the building such as an administrator, a counselor, or a teacher will screen those applicants. Then we have another group that will interview the applicants. And these are sample questions that we may have for an elementary teacher. Uh, once that is completed, then we go through an interview team rating scale. And that is rated individually. Then it is given to the HR person, Ms. Hollowfield, and she will go ahead and tabulate the scores. And we'll take the top two individuals as they rate it out. Uh, do you, I'm concerned that maybe we should put in writing because, you know, part of the problem was that the procedure, how things were being done, you know, just like, well, you kind of go ahead and you say, I'm subject to board approval, we're going to, we're going to hire you. Because it, it wasn't, um, 
that's just kind of the practice, as, as you said. But that, that, that has been stressed to our administrators. But can, should we not put that maybe in the procedure? It, that it says that all applicants Is it not in there, Shannon? I thought I saw says, that. It says all applicants will be promptly notified once a decision has been made on the position. So not prior to the decision being made. Decision by the board? Once a decision has been made. Before the applicant will be informed, he will have to go before the board for approval. Then we will go ahead and inform the applicant. Okay. As long as it's in there, I just Yeah. This, this, maybe this isn't the this doesn't address the transfers. No. Okay. That's another policy. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Questions on that? Comments? I think, I think you need to put that in policy. I, I think it needs to be clearer. It's a procedure. I, just to be clear, are we adding that verbiage on this page? Mm -hmm. That'd be fine. Can you read that? By the board? Yeah, I read the policy. That's where it said it. Oh, the policy the says it. All applicants will be promptly notified once a decision has been made on the position. Right, but the, the procedure is what was met. I think that's why it needs to change say. the procedure. That's what we'll do on that, and we'll be fine. Yeah. The second part of that is GCI, which is dealing with transfers, and we discussed this last time too. And what I recall from that discussion is this, that if a teacher is, for example, at the kindergarten and they have a, a salary jump, for example, they move to an administrator of one of the elementary buildings, that that should become before the board for approval. However, if you have a lateral move, for example, I have a teacher at Southeast that wishes to go to Lee Hunter, teacher to teacher position, that should be an internal transfer. I guess this has been the, the, my request again. If I feel like this is the request, I don't mean to. Oh, my God. I don't. Um, but I, I address that. I, I think we've got a twofold issue here and when you look at GCD-1 we've had we've got this verbiage in there under recruiting the last statement um, the last sentence in the first paragraph it says a position is not considered vacant if the board superintendent or designee assigns an existing employee to the position and and I'm just going to lay out my thoughts is that I think that should be stricken because I think we should be on everything no, no the, the last sentence a position is not considered vacant we're, we're at we're back I'm sorry I just got I'm sorry GCD-1 right. policy under recruiting the first paragraph under there the last sentence okay position is not considered vacant if the board superintendent or designee assigns an existing employee to the position. So that's a carte blanche. It's not considered vacant to assign an existing employee to the position, which is where you can get a, you've got a teacher at the high school that is an employee that you assign to be assistant superintendent. I would just mention though that that would take an approval of the Board of Education for that to happen, correct? Well, it the argument has been made when I brought that up that this allows you to do that. And I remember Nichols saying he interpreted it that way, saying that means you can do that. And I said I wouldn't interpret it that way. There's I want to make sure that there's differentiation between that and a lateral move. Because I don't want to tie the hands of whomever's going to be here 10 years down the road when they can't move a person to another position based on need of that particular building. If there's, you know, what, you know what I'm saying, lateral move? Well, I think when you get into, I understand that I think the teaching staff, professionals, but when you get into doing admin and this office and moving people, you might call it a lateral move, but I think that's something that's got enough money attached salary-wise to that position, whether it's lateral right. or not, that it's an administrative or central office professional move that that should go through and at least I mean I say 99.9% .9 of the time 
everything like that is going to be approved, but it should be watchdog. And I told you, I think there's also could be some stressors on you as <coughs> superintendent. You know, you do have relationships with people, and you, there's there are potential conflicts that could come into that, as I would see it. it Relieve that, like, hey, I, can, I gotta take it to the board. I think you'd be great in that position, but. I thought, this, I thought this addressed that, though, when it said that uh, internal people were allowed to interview for that position. Because I know like when Shannon was hired, she had to go through the whole interview process. It wasn't, um, it wasn't just a move for her. But the step further would be that she would not only interview, take care of that process, but she would also be approved by the board. That's what, That's I, what I understand. Yeah. That's fine. I just don't want to restrict the lateral move. With a teacher to teacher, from building to building. Does this particular sentence? Or principal to principal. Does it? My understanding no. is, it's first opened up if there's a if there's an open position. It first goes the the, the, the current teachers, and I'm usually thinking about teachers in this instance with regard to this. Are given first dibs at it before it's published, but not always. Yeah. It's opened up internally. Yeah, as you well open up it internally, internally and externally. Right. Doesn't this sentence though mean that if it's a if it's an internal move that doesn't that position does not have to be opened up externally? Right. That's, okay. Right. That's the third way. Right. So then I have think to it be should be stricken because I think if we're talking about money and salaries at the at the levels of our administrators, that should be for I got you. So yeah. it's not that this sentence exists. In recruiting, with regard to <coughs> teachers, that there's a line of a move to administration. It would not need to be Yeah, okay. if you're if you're moving teachers laterally between buildings, I'm not seeing that as okay. the issue. I think everybody's on the same page. I just and I think we're going to have to tweak with GCI a little bit to make sure it reads about the reassignments. I think. You know, you can temporarily maybe reassign people to a different place. Would this not be something that you you adjust your uh, procedure for versus your policy? Is That's it more of a procedural I, thing, an administrative it's thing, than a management? Well, no, I mean, it's it's, it's, it's no. This it's, is micromanaging. I mean, this is talk. I mean, this is this is just, and I'm not trying to make light of the situation, but this is personnel matters that. We hire Tom to, to make those managerial decisions. And yes, we obviously have input, but man, this is a this is micromanaging, if you ask me. It's a it's something that wasn't well received in the community. No. I've had no one mention that to me. Not one person. Just not approachable, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you definitely don't go yeah. to basketball games or anything. No, I'm right? never out in the community never. anywhere. Well, you well, know, one of the one of the main jobs of the school board is to hire. So when you're putting someone, I don't care if you're a, an employee already, and you're, you're hiring for another position, it should be more approved. That's not micromanaging, that's doing People your job. People are with the hire. district? Lateral move? No, if, if they're with the district, if they're with the district, we have, he has enough authority. No. The, the, He's sorry, our no. I disagree. Employee. Teacher, yeah. if you have a teacher at Southeast that wants to go to Lee Hunter, yes. put him there. It's a lateral move. It doesn't need more that, approval. That's what I'm saying. What are we if arguing you, about? If you have a teacher, <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely lost. I think I'm smart, but I don't know. That <laughs> wants to apply for a different position other than a classroom teacher. A pay raise. A pay raise based upon their their position. For example, a teacher to an assistant principal would be a pay increase. That should be brought before the Board of Education for approval. I'm fine with that. I, I still think it's micromanaging. I, yeah. I, if the board, if that's the board's desire, then that's fine. But I still think it's a micromanaging move, in my opinion. I think I think we all are saying the same thing, and I think Tom's committed to do this procedurally, but he does not wish to change the policy. And I'm happy to change the procedure to, if you know, to bring that towards us. But I, I don't. Well, I, think I'm, we need I'm to talking, the I don't know if we are. I'm, I thought I heard everybody say we're on the same page about it. it's an administrative. I think if it's that's what Tom said. Yeah, that's right. stuff. Right. Right. You know, what if lateral move? No. If no. it's an assistant, it would be an 
simply just inform the Board of Education that Johnny is moving from Southeast to Lee Hunter as a teacher. Even as but a principal? Yeah, but administratively, if you're an assistant <coughs> principal at a building and you're going to be an assistant principal somewhere else, I think we should prove that. No, I disagree. I disagree. I, I, that's total I disagree. Michael management. I mean, he can be principal where he needs to make them. Totally. Unless you're promoting that administrator, I don't think you need them. Tom, Tom needs to have the authority to run the ship. Yeah. Yeah. And if he's not running the ship effectively, then that's our job to yeah. deal with Tom. Yeah. So. I'm happier about the non-lateral limits so that everybody can agree on that. I don't think it's a big enough. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary, but I would go along with it. I think it's, again, it's, we're, we're, we're not doing what we are here for. I do not think we have the right to allow somebody to increase anybody's income without us like, unless it's under the natural course. I do not Actually, think you're talking about salaries and stuff, and you go, well, I'm bumping you up 20 grand to this new position. We've got to approve that. I think we have Actually, it's within the guidelines. It, it, I have checked with MSBA, and they said it's it's fine, and there's nothing illegal, I guess. It's not to, to do what we're currently doing, and many school districts do that, although you find that there's a lot of different ways in which they hire. We're talking about hiring a new uh, principal for a school that is not an employee of the district. I told you, obviously, we have to we have to make that decision. But moving around, I think that's just a personal decision. I think, well, I, okay, but I think if we're adding income to their salary, we, should, we have to say, okay. If you yeah. open a if you open up a position for anybody to apply, that has to be board approved. I mean, it, it you just said though the lateral moves. <laughs> are, are you gonna Are you gonna open up if, if a teacher from Southeast wants to move to Lee Hunter? Are you gonna open that position up for anybody to apply? Yes. Internally. Oh Internally. yes, and we have. I'm talking about to the general public. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So if someone from Southeast, Case, let, let me give an example. A, give an example, please. Okay. We just did it. We just did it. Uh, opened up job at, at uh, Lee Hunter. We opened it. We had outside candidates and inside candidates. All candidates went through the screening process. All candidates interviewed. Now, I don't, and, and we're given, scored on the rubric. I don't know what the outcome of that is at this point, but let's just say it <coughs> was an internal candidate. Then we're saying in that instance, it would not have to be board approved if they are moving from one elementary school to another. Right. Am I correct? Yes. That's yes. What just where we are right now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> So if they're already one of our employees, it's basically what we're saying. They already work in the district, and we're not going to make them be approved again to just move to a different building in our district. If they're good enough for one building, they're good enough for another building. My, my point in all this is that we have Tom, we have Shannon, we have Chuck, we have Wynn to make appropriate personnel decisions other than new hires. If we're doing that, then why do we need them? I mean, we're doing part of their job for them. That's why we hire them. That'd be like me hiring a teller and then going over there and counting the drawer for them. So what does he think? I think, I think, I, I'm not talking, I'm talking about something that's different. You know, I'm making a lot of increasing their financial wherewithal. I think that it doesn't look good for us not to approve that. I think we're all saying we are going to approve it. <laughs> Right. I, I said I would go along with it. I just, I said I will. I just think it's unnecessary. Oh. But, um. but I think that's an administrative procedure. Yeah. It's not a policy. I mean, this is, this is, this is this a total. Is, this is, this, the administrators manage the district, the boards govern it. So. I think it should be a policy. What well, can we back up just a minute and so I get clear in my mind what we're talking about here because I've heard several different things. First off, are we, are y'all saying that the lateral moves, as we gave an example, that's fine. Yeah. However, if there's a pay increase, that needs to be approved. Now, that's set, right? However, now we're determining whether it should be a policy or a procedure. Procedures are what... Those guidelines we follow, you follow guys, policy. You know, follow and can change. And we're not supposed <coughs> to get involved in that. I think it should be a policy category. I think 
that should be in place. I don't agree. I think it could be simply just an administrative procedure and follow that. And we're going to follow the administrative procedure. Well, if you don't, you're going to get fired. Yes. So that's, I mean, that's not a lie. I mean, right? that's, yes. I mean, that's why we have you. I mean, my boss doesn't call me and want to know why I didn't hire a certain teller. I mean, he hires me to make those decisions. We hire Tom to make those decisions. New candidates, yes, because that's a contract. But that's that's my point. That's that's what I'm that's how I'm seeing this. If if my boss wanted to hire the teller, he doesn't need me, or he doesn't need the branch manager to make those decisions. When you when you enter into a contract, you're entering into a contract for a particular position, or is it just a generic employment contract? Everybody's the same. I mean, it, it depends if you're a teacher, a tenured teacher, or or support staff. <clears throat> and generally speaking, you're hired as a teacher, and because that's given special treatment under the statute. It, it, right. It means when you're certified, that you, you legally have that. Well, I'm really talking about tenured. professional staff. You're, you're talking about professional, about professional staff. staff. You're not talking about. So that. your teachers are all in the same language contract. Yes. What about your Administration, your administrators, are they? With the exception of me. With the exception of Tom, they're all, they're all the same. And we've talked about that before, and that's going to, before next. You're basically going to have the same framework. Same framework. Yes. However, number of days will vary. Right, based on the contract. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 
or should have the vote of the board whether or not to approve that hire. Because it is a new hire. Because it is, you're, you're, what we hired that person for, you're putting them in a different position. But what, what Brian was saying is we hire them as a teacher. We don't hire them as a teacher to teach second grade at Southeast, yeah, right? In general, yes. You just hire them as a teacher. And this is where they think they're going to go, but they could show up and maybe go somewhere else. I, I think everybody's saying the same, the same thing. Absolutely the same thing. I, I, it's just going around in a circle. I, I, I do think. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it is. I mean, the school board. Are we just debating whether the policy is here? Yes. Are we all agreeing so. that we ought to approve the, that the, uh, the uh, I say we show up Tuesday and vote on it. Let's move on to the next time. Same, same thing. Okay. I mean, I tend to agree too that we should approve the. the <laughs> 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 yeah, that if we have a new administrator that gets a promotion. Yeah, a promotion. Do I could. I could. We can do that. Uh, okay. Um, what I'll do then. Since we have to have a third day, I have to present to you for consideration. So I'll present those two board policies to you for consideration. And then we'll go from there. Okay. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Moving on to the next one item under uh, the SPS Foundation. We do have three individuals that no longer wish to be on the Ed Foundation board, and that being um, Sharon Black, Ellen Brandon, and Dan Jennings, and their term expires as of the 8th of March. Is it March? I thought we could do that this March. Is it March when the term expires? Yes, it does. All right, all right. I am bringing it to the attention of the board. I simply wanted to inform the board that the Ed Foundation has selected three individuals, Chris Hodgkiss, uh, Michelle Worth, and Norman Biles. Uh, that will be brought before the Board of Education for approval during the March meeting. So should we, should we yes. go ahead and uh, approve it? Would there be a problem approving it in February so that uh, Lauren can maybe? I guess not. They just they have another meeting yet to attend in oh, February. Okay. So they're, they're still yeah, active. that's right. They're so still we can't active. approve them until they're off. Right. 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 That's right. And so that's why we typically yeah. approve them in March. So they can come to the meeting. Right. right. Exactly. That's right. I'm sorry. True. Questions on that? Okay, before we go into the agenda, I just want to touch on a few informational items and we'll go into the agenda. We do have the Chamber Awards Banquet, that is the April 14th, and if you're interested in that, uh, and or the CMO Superintendent's Banquet, which is the 26th of April, uh, please contact Carrie with that information. MSBA Regional Meeting, I know a few of you would like to go to that. Scott typically has, and the rest of us went to the, the one last fall. I don't know where it is yet, uh, but when that information uh, comes out, I'll get that to you. When is it generally, though? Um, it's April, June, I think. Yeah, I think it is. Good. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, it was. Not very well attended. Mm -hmm. I thought we were talking about achievement. That's on my agenda. Oh, it was on the no. I'm sorry, it was on if I interrupt, it was on the board the the no agenda you sent out. Yeah. But then on the actual work session agenda it's not there. I don't know why, but that's I guess because it wasn't adequate information to go forward with that. We, it says uh, board retreat or retreat board session, retreat. academic achievement. Oh, but it's not, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm putting it again, but it's not on the agenda that was actually approved. I don't know why. It was on the agenda that you sent out, the superintendent notes, but on the actual... Yeah, it's not on there. I don't know. Oh, yeah, it's on there before. Mm -hmm. I have no knowledge of why, but that, I, I understand what Heather's saying. That's, that's a discrepancy, because I've got that printed in the one with your notes is why. I just went and looked, because I had the same question. Was there? Is there any comments about the, the board retreat? I know it's not on the agenda, but this is a work session. And could we could we be so could I be so bold as to say you may talk about it? Let's let's amend the agenda to add that item, just so we're clear on everything. Is there a reason to I guess if, if is there a need to want to discuss that or can we put that off again until another month? 
I'm asking them. Well, I think that we've said at the board retreat, didn't we say that, or that it was something that we needed to discuss pretty quickly? That we wanted we to did. Not put we it did off. make mention of that. You could also discuss it Tuesday. Yeah, put it on the agenda Tuesday, right? Yeah, put it on the agenda Tuesday. I'll make a motion to amend Tuesday. You can just amend it. You book it 24 hours. Okay. Okay, how is that going to be presented? That's hard to say. Is that something we want to <laughs> I'm just asking because versus, that's more of a discussion time for the Board of Education. We're not right. As opposed to I don't think it should go in regular session. I, mean, I think it should be on our award session. I mean, that, that, that's fine, too. That makes sense. Is everybody okay with doing it in uh, March? Um, I also mentioned on there as far as the snow day and uh, going down the informational items. I think everybody's well aware. Of, is there any question on that? We, we're going to do like we did the last couple years. Um, hopefully, we don't have any snow between now and that February 15th date. And it looks the weather forecast looks really good. We're going to be in school, so we won't have to go ahead and make it up on that day. Um, Basically, we have one more day that we can be asked for forgiveness, and then after that, we're going to have to start making them up. Um, I will bring that to the board in March to have that forgiven. All right, going on to the board agenda itself, we do have three recognitions. We have the Dell Medical Center will be recognized for their donation of, of some flat panels, computer flat panels that they did donate to the school system and they have been dispersed around. Uh, Mark Stevener, I think everybody's aware that he received a Lifetime Service uh, to Wrestling Award here in October, I believe it was. We're just now getting that information. We appreciate that. Uh, if you don't know Mark, Mark was a longtime wrestling coach back in the 80s and 90s. He left here in like 93 or 94, went to someplace in St. Louis and then came back here and coached at Notre Dame for a short time. And then also we have some academic all-state. Shannon, who do we have for that? We have some basketball, football? Uh, football, volleyball, and soccer. Okay. And right. softball. And softball basketball. as well. So we'll, we'll be right back. Yes. Yes. Same group. That's really nice way to recognize this. Yeah. Very nice. Absolutely. Uh, items of informational. We have the Focus County Plan update. We have the Junior High Achievement update. And then we have student enrollment, and we just got those numbers in. We're at 3,375. It's down eight students from last month. Uh, it's not as significant as it was the month before, but it's still showing a downward trend. Uh, also included in that, the next item is student discipline. And you can take a look at that discipline. discipline. Um, at the request of the board, we did include that of the Alternative Center. And you can see that on the, I believe it's my third page on the hard copy of what uh, their discipline was as far as ISS and OSS and the number of days and the, the breakdown, whether it be white, black, uh, Hispanic, or multiracial. Questions on that? That's a, I, I think this particular handout that I'm giving to the board now is more beneficial, much more beneficial than the old one. It breaks it down, you have a better understanding of what is being uh, done out there, the types of uh, descriptors that are, are being dealt with, and uh, the discipline that's being assigned uh, per building. You know what you could do with those charts, and I agree, but you could put, you could divide the total by the number of students, give you a percentage yeah. real quick. You could. Just at, at a glance, just to see if there's one school that pops out that's Yeah, that wouldn't take anything to do that. In addition to this, uh, requiring action, uh, we will go into exec session to discuss personal matters as listed on your packet. I believe it tells you exactly what we're going in there for, uh, and we will be discussing on Tuesday night. We will be presenting curriculum, uh, that of mathematics, in the format that was presented there. 
Are there any questions on that that will be presented? If I can interrupt, I do have uh, administrators, math coaches, and I'll, let's see if a few teachers have shown up too, so if there are questions, feel free. I already asked my question before we started. <laughs> I just want to say to you guys, because since, you know, I first was elected on the board in, I would have been in 07, I guess, or 08, 08. Um, just the amount of improvement in the math department, department is amazing. And I, I, can, I can see it just between my children within two years, you know, some of the differences. And I think the opportunities that especially are being given to the upper level kids is amazing what you guys are doing. And I was told the other day that now some of the stuff that used to be done in fourth grade is actually being done in third grade and that they're really seeing the kids advance so much faster in the lower grades that they're getting to, uh, to concept sooner. So that's encouraging as well. But I do appreciate, I know it's a lot of work to come up with these new courses every year. And I appreciate the work that you guys do. I see that on that list, math curriculum list that we have, CP Algebra 3 and then Trig, which used to be a single year-long course. We divide that up, correct, by semester. That's correct. Okay. Um, and in addition, we will be adding AP Statistics. We'd like to do that. Okay. Is that a year-long Is that a year -long class? <laughs> take that. That's a year-long class, Betsy? It is a year-long class. Okay. And they, they will have the opportunity, just like anybody else, to take that wonderful exam at the end in order to... Uh, try to I strongly escape. encourage you know and talk you know talking about because I don't know how many people actually take our AP calculus test. It's something I'd like to you know really encourage that the kids actually take the test um, and the, the statistics. That, I mean, I'll, you know, the instructor will be you know this is what you do all year long. You talk about taking that test exactly. And, you know because it really benefits. It does. And a lot of you know I think the nice thing um, not you know the STEM things that need calculus. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of kids that you don't don't necessarily need a calculus to get through their college degree, but statistics is something that's more you know in that liberal arts and some of those things. So I think that it's, it's really business. it's a really neat opportunity for us to go ahead and add that um, to our to our curriculum, and I'm super excited. Um, I want to let you know that um, it's not been placed in units and things because it kind of deter you know determines what resource we actually pick you know to do that, and um, that instructor will go to a week long. Um, you know, and if, if Mr. Mays asks me to attend that with them, um, I will do that. The instructor will be, you know, going to a training that is, you know, gets them ready for that. Um, mm -hmm. And much of much of the things are determined by the college board um, about what you know what you have to teach and you know in preparation for that exam. It's and, still three, four, five, correct on that AP exam, which allows you, but it depends on the university, or correct. correct as far as what they accept for credit. Yes. So, let me clarify my disdain for statistics. If I were, if I were um, exposed to it in high school, it would have made it much. Oh, I think, and the nice thing about you know spreading that over a year, um, they're going to be able to do some really neat projects and, and just the things that we can do with um, technology now and with the iPad and all that. I'm super excited um, about you know getting to offer this. Yeah, that's a, it's a big deal and all. Like and so I mean, it'll benefit you know um, a, a wider assortment of, of students and. You know, we're allowing, you know, if you've taken CP Algebra 2, that's what's going to be the predictor. You know, whereas in order to take calculus, you have to take the pre-calc courses, you know, call it the Algebra 3. And so there's going to be a wider assortment of kids that can take that um, AP statistics. So I think it's going to be a great opportunity. That's what I was going to ask you. If it was Algebra 2, was the Algebra 2, yeah. going to it. And, you know, the nice thing about technology and, um, is that, you know, it makes statistics so much more usable. You know, they don't have to crank out all that stuff whenever we have technology that allows to do that and we can actually focus on the, the understanding and see how to apply that kind of thing. It's just a completely different ballgame from when I was in school and when we were probably went through. That's why it was hard. Yeah. I'm telling you, that's why I hate it. Yeah. You know, to say something that Amy said, and I'm sitting here thinking about this, and she said, now that we're asking fourth graders, asking third graders to do what fourth graders used to do. No, 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 they're doing activities that some of the fourth graders use. Some of the things 
a former te fourth grade teacher told me she was visiting a third grade classroom and she said she saw some of the activities being used that they typically used to do in fourth grade, but now they're able to do them in third grade. So it wasn't the expectation of the curriculum was any different, it was that they're using some activities because the, the kids are seem to be catching on to things faster. Maybe you can explain that better, Kathy, I don't know. And but when, when you're saying, are, are we going to talk about achievement? Do we want to talk about math achievement? I think we tabled that one. You're talking about the achievement, board retreat achievement? I mean, she, she just made a comment that we're doing so much better in math. I mean, do we want to go there? I mean, do we want to discuss that tonight? I think we can do that in March. As far as the achievement, yes. Yeah. Now, the board retreat information was dealing with student achievement. That was the goal of the board, and that was going to be discussed during the March board session. Okay. Then I'll save my comments for then. Okay. Anything else on math curriculum? All right. In addition to that, we will be approving the family and consumer science curriculum of food management, nutrition, and wellness. Uh, courses, you can see there the same type of thing, the course description, scope and sequence, uh, rationale, and the targets and so on and so forth are also mentioned within this curriculum for those two classes. The next item is board policy DGA, which is dealing with that of authorized signatures. Now, let me ask a question real quick. Is family and consumer science what you call foods? No. Or is that a different class? It would be home ec. Family and Consumer Science is under... Food is just foods, right? Yeah, and that would fall under the uh, Family and Consumer Science label. Okay. If it helps, both these courses are at SCTC. Is foods? Foods is? Yeah. But that's, I, I, mean, that's I don't fun. recall, Shannon. Do you recall? I don't remember anymore. There was Foods 1 and Foods 2, I think, is what we used to have at the high school or SCTC. I think um, you still do. That's why I was wondering. Is this the same thing as foods, or it's, it's not? I think it's different. It's a different course. Okay. Yeah. There's a national uh, course I think it's called that. Yeah, foods a different direction. Right. Yeah. Okay, a little right. more. The emphasis is going to be a different direction than what just your foods class is. Okay. This is, correct me if I'm wrong, this was a request by the new, the new teacher, the new teacher right. that she wanted to have this course. Okay. She thought it was important. next item is that of DGA, which uh, we talked about this, actually, I think it was in December board meeting, and we, we added a sentence, our sentence was added to the existing policy. Um, I didn't get that to you, and I apologize, but on page three of that policy that you have there, under federal and state grants, funds, or programs, we added in there, otherwise, unless otherwise specified in the federal or state grant or contract, the superintendent or designee has the authority to sign necessary assurances and compliance documents as previously agreed upon by the board. That was the sentence that we took down and we're going to add. We ran that to MSBA and basically MSBA says there's really no need to add that simply because you're stating the same basic thing on the next sentences. My feeling is, why add something to more than the policy if it's not really going to be beneficial to that policy? And that's kind of what I'm thinking. They were saying that you're still, the board is still covered. Um, I'll just read exactly what they say. Um, he said, the next sentence, the next sentence down there, uh, clearly states the superintendent will assure that the documents meet the necessary requirements. And the final sentence of the policy also states that the board may view the documents at any time. That's their take on it. I didn't think that if we didn't need to add anything additional to that policy, I didn't see any reason to. I think you got to have it in there. I, there was, and, and I think, wasn't the concern that the board should approve the receiving of a grant, yeah. not the compliance after the fact which is going to be something the administration is going to do to say, okay, to get this grant we have to do these things and we have to certify that these things have been done. It's more that the board 
you don't get a grant unless the board approves it. And that actually, just to kind of build on what MSBA said, I didn't, if you look at DDAP1, it says grants requiring local matching funds or grants for schools or the district must be approved by the Board of Education. So I think your concern, this, the policy DGA is about, when they talk about who can sign things, this, that's about the compliance after the grant has been, been approved, received, or is in the process of being received, and you've got the various administrators saying, we've done these things that we're required to do, and we make these certifications. But the board has to approve the receipt of a grant. Whether they're a local matching fund or not. Right, right, because it says, well, it says, or grants for schools. Well, I can't think of another scenario where you, there would ever be a grant. It's for the school or for the district. So, well, but what, what, the, what I was saying with this, okay, it says it's not just dealing with grants, it's dealing with funds and programs. So, federal and state grants, funds, or programs. And when it says that, unless otherwise specified in the federal or state grant contract, the superintendent has the authority to sign necessary assurances and compliance documents on behalf of the board. I think that anything that the school district has to do to, and I'm not talking about like I know he was saying like Mr. Crater has to sign documents saying we did this, you know, all the time. I don't think that's what we were saying, right. that we have to approve those documents. It's not that. It's just that anything that goes along with a grant, any funds we get, or any programs, that that should come before the board. Not necessarily when Tom or Shannon or Mr. Crater sits there and signs the documents saying to these programs or state or federal or whatever that we've done the, this. But whatever the, that comes along with it has to be approved. And I think that's why we agree to add that language into this policy. And, and, and I, I don't have any problem with the language as it was, was added. I do think because once, once, the question was asked, I think, during that meeting was, is there another policy that addresses this? And, and the answer now that everybody's had a chance to look at it is yes, it, at least as to grants, it's it certainly, it, it certainly addressed in, this, in the policy that's right before it. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be superfluous, but... That's the exact word I was <laughs> but, but, but that, I mean, it's not... Well, but you know, like you said, it's just dealing with grants. Yeah. The, well, the, and there, there may be, and I looked at it with an eye toward grants, Heather. I didn't look at it for an eye toward funds or programs simply because, of, well, I, re I really didn't read it that way, and I didn't really wasn't concerned with the title. But, boy, I bet there's something in the policies that says that those, those have to be approved by the board as well, because I think, aren't they routinely, I mean, you all approve Title I issues every year? Yeah. But then you're going to have two policies that are conflicting. Because you've got one policy that's saying it has to be approved by the board. <coughs> and you, then you have this policy saying that the superintendent or designee has the authority, authority to sign insurance and compliance documents on behalf of the board. So those two, that, that wouldn't even, that would be, you, you could. I'm sure that MSBA has checked that, though, as far as the conflicting policy. The way this is, the way I read this is that the, the, the superintendent or say when and can sign and says that we have complied to meet this grant. That's how I, I mean, it's, it's fairly straightforward. I mean, you, you can add that language in there as you stated, as previously agreed upon by the board. There is nothing legal, illegal, I guess, about that. You can still put that in there and it's not going to prohibit you from doing anything. I just felt like that why put it in there if it's not really going to benefit you either way. And that was kind of the take I got from MSBA is it wasn't going to help you or hurt you, so why add anything to the policy? I think that's where I showed us the other one, where it is in there. Well, it may be there's no reason to add it. There's no reason it, to add it. Well, and it may be that we need to look at the issue of funds and programs to make sure that that issue is addressed as grants were in the ADAP. <coughs> I think that would be fair. Mm -hmm. And then I think that, yeah, then I think you can decide, do we want to add this or do we not want to add this? Are we comfortable with what we got? 
or do we need to add these three words? And either way, the board is going to have to approve grants and funds and things like that, like they always like, like, like you'd have to do. But thank goodness you don't have to approve the compliance document. So and what you're saying is you're, you think the compliance documents are what they're signing, yes. saying we've done this. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think DGA deals necessary, that section. It says necessary assurances right. and compliance documents. I think that you have a policy, like you said, and you can look and see if it's, you have anything with funds or programs, that's fine before we change it. But I think you've got a policy before it that is saying one thing. And you have a policy behind the next policy, which is this one, that's saying something different. I, I, we, we, can cross, we can cross-reference those policies will, and check. However, I don't know that it does. I don't, I, I don't read it that way because it talks about the assurances and the, and the compliance documents. But, I mean, if, the, if, it, if, it, if, it helps, if it helps clarify it, again, I don't, I don't think the board is remiss in adopting the language. So... Let's find out. Let me, let me look at something on the funds and programs, see if there's something like this. I'm pretty confident there is, and then we'll, I can send everybody an email and you can decide, or you can decide. I don't decide anything. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We will have the ratification of bills. And uh, did everybody have the opportunity to look through this information? It appears to be pretty straightforward. Next we have on there, we have the approval of minutes under consent. Uh, we have sale of surplus property. We first off have school buses. Ron Hampton has indicated that we have two buses, 96 and a 99 Cooper, that he would like to surplus uh, simply because the age of those vehicles is getting to a point where it's hard to find parts. And so they have to fabricate those parts and there's an additional cost. So, plus we need to consider also that of inspections. We need to move those buses out, get our new buses in, and it just makes things a lot more. So they're extra. There are buses that we do not need. We surplus from call, was it two months ago, I believe, we surplus two buses, we have to surplus another two. Because we just simply don't need them right now. They are detrimental. They are detrimental. Thank you for it. <laughs> they're going to hurt us. Because if we have them, even if we don't use them, they're expected. They are. They are expected. Um, we also have surplus property, an SCTC item, which is a t-shirt dryer that has, uh, that we are going to go ahead and surplus. Uh, apparently it's been uh, replaced um, a couple years ago, two or three years ago, and, and uh, replaced with two newer ones. And if you ever had the opportunity to go over there and check that out, it's pretty cool as far as how that, that operates. The sweatshirt? Yes. <laughs> so we it is, is extremely impressive. Yes, it is. No doubt. Um, on the substitute teacher report, and I'm not going to mention names right now, however, you notice, I believe, still on your report, and I'm going to call that up, there's a name on there, uh, that top name, that will be removed from the substitute teacher report before it's presented to you all on Tuesday. Um, in addition to that, we do have a retirement. We do have Ms. Amstead. We also have a resignation, and that's not on mine. We have, um, gosh, help me out here. Yes, Andrea Roth is going to resign her position as well. That's all I have. Anybody have any questions or comments? If not, we'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Brian, what are you looking at as far as I'm a little bit.